In about one minute. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Jim Cahill, and I'm here with Greg McMillan. I'll wave a little bit. Um, welcome to today's session of Greg's Live Process Control Seminar and Demo Series. We call these Deminars for short. Today's topic is how to set up and adjust the dynamic compensation of feed-forward signals. This broadcast is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. And we'll be muting all but Greg's microphone, so please use the Q&A box to ask questions of Greg, and then I'll relay them verbally during the course of today's session. And we like to keep these interactive, so as questions occur to you, uh, fire away with that question and answer box. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Greg. Well, welcome. These uh, seminars are sponsored uh, by Emerson, Xperia Tech, local business partner in St. Louis, uh, Monsanto, their headquarters in, in St. Louis, and Mina uh, Technologies, who's also in St. Louis. Created by um, me, Greg McMillan, and Jack Ehlers. Jack Ehlers is a uh, process control specialist at uh, Monsanto. And um, the website uh, was created by uh, Charlie Schleiser. So this has been a team effort, um, largely uh, extracurricular, uh, but we enjoy doing it. Uh, you probably know me by now, and the fact that um, I'm known for my top ten list. So let's get into uh, the traditional top ten list at the beginning of the seminar. So uh, this one is the top ten things you don't want to hear on a startup. Uh, the source is a final word on instrument upgrade projects, and that's in the control talk uh, column uh, in the control magazine, uh, December uh, 2010 issue, uh, which is online um, at this address right there. Uh, it's, a, it's a really a good interview with Hunter Vegas, who has a lot of experience doing instrument upgrade projects. So I encourage you. Uh, to take a look at that, and he came up actually with uh, most of this top ten list. So, uh, the top ten things you don't want to hear in a startup. Number ten, you need to be the owner. You need the owner to be a little more patient. This is what was said by a supplier expert. Don't bother with a checkout. Just light it up. What is the worst that can happen? We didn't do any simulation or testing. We decided that would spoil the adventure. I don't understand. It fit fine on the drawing. Cool. This is my first time in a real plant, said by a supplier expert. Uh, nearly all of these things uh, either I or Hunter have heard in startups. Number five. I tried to open the valve and nothing happened. Wait. The same valve on the other reactor just opened. Number four, should the variable frequency drive smoke like that? Three, I don't understand. I'm sure I left all of your tools and radios in a box right here. Two, the CEO is holding on a phone for you. Never a good thing. And the number one thing, boom, what was it? So we're going to actually look at feed-forward control in a cascade control system. And uh, you could have feed-forward control going in uh, at the uh, secondary loop. And the secondary loop is um, uh, right here. Uh, 
Uh, and you could have secondary feed forward going in here. Uh, but um, hopefully the secondary loop is a very fast loop. Uh, for example, it could be a flow loop. And uh, a lot of the disturbances that might originate, for example, on a flow loop, uh, whether it's due to the valve or pressure uh, at the valve, uh, we hopefully we've tuned that loop uh, well enough and good enough to handle those disturbances. Also, if we did introduce a secondary feed forward uh, that would go to the valve, um, as you know, most valves are nonlinear. So we get into a, uh, a difficulty in terms of the feed forward gain uh, being nonlinear. And further, that nonlinearity changes with the installed characteristic, which is a function of the allowable pressure drop across the valve. So secondary feed forwards on flow loops uh, uh, don't turn out to be as advantageous as you might think, unless something very smart is done in terms of modeling that control valve. And uh, I know that has been done by uh, Russ Reinhardt, um, who is the uh, editor of ISA Transactions. What we're going to focus on instead is uh, the uh, primary upset coming in, primary loop upset coming in. And, um, and we're also going to realize that we have a 20 second delay in the path of that upset coming in to the process. Now that upset comes in at uh, this point right here, and uh, it's downstream of the uh, secondary loop measurement. So the secondary loop measurement does not see the primary uh, load upset until it makes its uh, uh, traverse around the loop, and the primary PID is also reacted to it. So that's uh, you know a little bit late. And it's really not the job of the uh, of the secondary loop uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 take care of that primary uh, loop load upset. So we're going to look at uh, using uh, primary feed forward, which is uh, added to the output of the primary PID, and see uh, what we can do to improve our reaction to the primary load upset by a preemptive change uh, by the use of feed forward. In other words, we're going to try and do something that recognizes, that measures this primary uh, load upset, and uh, then takes a preemptive action to uh, correct it by adding in a signal here, uh, which is the primary feed forward signal. And um, we're going to look uh, particularly at the timing of this, because that's something that's not uh, really discussed, I think, adequately in uh, the literature. Uh, so there's a lot of details that can be helpful if you if you know them in terms of the implementation of, uh, of feed forward. And so I'm going to go over some of the key ones right here. First of all, um, sometimes you see in academic papers that uh, they do a feed forward calculation and uh, they think that they got the model um, for the feed forward calculation so accurate uh, that they don't need feedback. But when you get into industrial processes, um, things are, are not that well known. They're not as perfect as they are in a model, certainly. And uh, we get into a, not, a lot of nonlinearities and assumptions, uh, which we'll take a look at briefly. And so it is really uh, essential that there always be a feedback correction in industrial processes. Um, while technically the correction should be a multiplier for a change in slope and a, a bias for a change in intercept in the plot of the manipulated variable uh, versus uh, the independent variable, and this is key. Uh, this plot tells the story. Uh, so you should try and get that plot. Uh, and theoretically, uh, you would uh, then use a multiplier for a change in slope on that plot and a summer for a change in bias. Um, and when we say independent variable, we're really saying only that this uh, th this variable is independent by from this loop, could, but could be set by another loop, um, and that's frequently the case. It, it might be a feed flow set by a, a flow controller. 
Um, well, theoretically, a multiplier is uh, desirable and, and maybe the correct solution. Uh, it turns out that uh, there's scaling problems in that. And so consequently, uh, as a practical uh, implementation, uh, we most often just use a bias. And um, I'm going to do a um, blog uh, next uh, week on, on why bias is almost a universal correction for of, of, um, made by feedback controllers, whether you're talking about PID, correcting a feed forward, or whether you're doing a correction of a trajectory in a model predictive controller, or whether you're doing a correction of a prediction by a neural network. There's something universally advantageous about a bias that is kind of interesting, and I thought I would you know, kind of explore that next week. Um, you got to make sure, though, that the bias has a sufficient positive and negative range for the worst case. Uh, so that the feedback controller can take care of the worst uh, case scenario. Um, the other thing is that some people think, oh, well, I want to do ratio control. Uh, let's create a ratio variable uh, for the control variable. So they literally divide, um, you know, the uh, manipulated flow by the independent flow, and that becomes their control variable. But that introduces a severe nonlinearity. I mean, you're dividing, say, by your feed flows, for example. And so as the feed flow changes, uh, you get into uh, big changes in uh, the process gain associated with that. So instead of um, using a ratio as the controlled variable, uh, the independent variable is multiplied by a desired ratio, and the result is corrected by a feedback loop. With the process variable, uh, typically concentration, conductivity, gauge uh, and sheets, temperature, or pH, as the controlled variable. So um, typically we're looking at process variables uh, that are process outputs of higher importance, and uh, we're using that for feedback correction of a ratio. Uh, the feed forward gain is a desired ratio uh, for flow or load upsets. Uh, if you're going to do um, set point feed forward, and we did have a seminar showing that, uh, the feed forward gain is the inverse of the process gain. And uh, while we call it the process gain, it is really the open loop gain seen by the PID, uh, which is the product of uh, the um, manipulated variable process variable and measurement variable gains. So as uh, your install characteristic changes, your process changes, and if you were to change uh, the range on your or sp uh, span on your measurement, uh, that would change actually the process gain. And uh, so I like to call it the open loop gain because it depends uh, more on just the process, but also your implementation in terms of the control valve and the calibration of the measurement. And you got to make sure that it's dimensionless. Uh, feed forward action must be in the same direction as uh, feedback action for an upset. However, when you get into the feed forward control, uh, you're trying to make uh, the PV move in the same direction as the set point. So it's the opposite of control action if you're going to use set point feed forward. So if your uh, control action is reverse, uh, then your uh, set point feed forward action would be direct. Uh, for timing purposes, the feed forward delay and uh, lag is adjusted to match any additional delay and lag, respectively, uh, in the path of the upset so that the feed forward correction does not arrive too soon. And now, uh, feed forward lag uh, also has the possibility of a lead, and we use a lead lag. And here the lead is adjusted to compensate for any additional lag in the path of the manipulated variable so that the feed for correction does not arrive uh, too late. Um, the the actual and desired uh, feed forward ratio should be displayed uh, for, for the operator and for process operations and process technology and for control specialists, along with a bias correction by the process controller. So you can monitor how well is this feed forward gain and how well is this feed forward controller doing because if 
there are big bias corrections, uh, and these bias corrections for them are moving around a lot, but we can learn an awful lot about uh, how we should adjust uh, the feed forward gain and, and possibly the feed forward timing, although that gets a little trickier. Um, and we can best monitor these things by the use of a ratio block and a bias and gain block and, and instead of using the internal feed forward uh, calculation. Uh, so that's what we've got shown here. Uh, we have an, a pH example with a feed flow, uh, so it's an influence flow coming in, and we have an influence flow controller. But we're taking the PV of that as uh, the independent flow. Um, uh, and then we also have uh, the reagent flow under flow control. And um, we, we take that in as well as uh, the dependent flow that we're manipulating. Um, we have a uh, desired ratio coming in as a set point. And then because we know uh, both the reagent and influent flow, we can uh, calculate and therefore monitor as a PV an actual ratio. Coming out of this uh, ratio block as uh, after you've uh, multiplied uh, the independent flow by the desired ratio is a computed flow uh, that uh, comes and needs to be corrected at this point at a bias and gain. And we take uh, the feedback uh, correction here and uh, simply uh, add it in as a bias correction to this uh, bias and gain block. Uh, then uh, we come out at this point uh, of the bias and gain block. And uh, that becomes uh, the cascade um, in a set point of uh, the reagent uh, flow controller. Uh, and again, um, there's feedback correction uh, based on this example, neutralizer pH. And it's done uh, by way of a bias uh, correction at that point. Well, let's get into the labs. And uh, for the first lab, we're going to show what the upset is uh, without feed forward. And in order uh, to do that, I'm going to uh, go to my uh, desktop. And uh, we'll look at uh, feed forward lab uh, uh, three, uh, which I already have open. Uh, we're going to check and uh, make sure that the uh, upset uh, size is uh, is 10 percent. And uh, we're going to change uh, the feed forward gain in the measurements to zero because we want to see uh, what is the upset without feed forward control. So let's uh, do that. So we're going to check disturbances, and yes, we have a 10% upset. And then uh, we're going to go into measurements, and we're going to say, well, let's see uh, what the disturbance is without uh, feed forward action. So we're going to set that equal to zero. Uh, we're going to change the desired run time here uh, to uh, 70 seconds uh, because we're doing a demo and we want to see things a lot faster. We're going to change uh, the lab mode from explore to run, and then we're going to look at the uh, chart uh, for lab three. Now, there's a, a remember that there's a, a, about a 20 second delay. Uh, plus, uh, before I actually introduce a disturbance, uh, I, I wait f for things to settle out in case you you were doing something um, before the run. So it turns out to be probably about a 30 second delay before we're going to see um, a disturbance. And we should see it here in the trend chart. And it's starting. Uh, so let's um, highlight or put in bold uh, the primary process variable and also uh, the loop output. And uh, look at it here. And this is the disturbance uh, that we're getting uh, without any feed forward correction. Um, and it's uh, just relying upon uh, feedback correction and uh, the primary loop uh, working through 
Uh, the cascade loop, uh, secondary loop. Now, this is only going to run for 70 seconds, and then it's going to take the disturbance out, which uh, creates another disturbance uh, at the end of the run. So now we've gone back to the explorer mode. We're finished with the run, uh, but we're going to get another disturbance here uh, as a result of uh, us having finished the run. But again, it's going to take about 20 seconds for uh, it to happen because we have that 20 second delay in the upset path. But here we got it occurring, and so we have another uh, disturbance created by the fact uh, that we've gone back to the explorer mode, and now we have uh, removed the disturbance, and uh, therefore we're waiting on uh, the PID controller to do its thing. Can you move the trend a little bit to the left? Can okay. See most of the panel. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yeah. See it. Okay. And uh, now let's uh, go ahead and see where we are in terms of the uh, uh, demo. That's basically demo one. So now um, we're going to go on to demo two. Uh, can you see demo two steps okay? Yes. Yes, looks good. Okay, so in demo two, we're going to show the effect uh, of a feed forward correction arriving uh, right on time. Uh, so here we're going to set the primary feed forward gain equal to one. Uh, we're going to compensate for that delay in uh, the upset path by setting the primary feed forward delay at 20 seconds. And, and then we'll do another run and uh, see how uh, well we do with uh, feed forward control. So we're going to put in the proper feed forward gain, which is conveniently one. Uh, since we have 20 seconds of additional delay in the upset path, we're going to add 20 seconds here in the feed forward path. And uh, then we're going to change uh, to the run mode. And in about 30 seconds, um, we should have a disturbance. Now, uh, it's going to be tough to see it, hopefully, in the primary process variable. And we're going to have to focus more on uh, the secondary loop output to see what's uh, going on. Okay, so here we have the correction being made. Now, it's not a pure step because, again, we're applying it to a set point of a secondary loop. Uh, well, we got that secondary loop uh, tuned pretty fast, um, so it, it does a, a correction pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much right away, but it's not a, a, an exact step, um, again, because we're applying it on the output of the primary loop, which becomes the set point. Uh, of uh, the secondary loop. But notice um, we have really um, reduced that upset significantly. It's not perfect. Um, even though the uh, gain is perfect, uh, the timing of 20 seconds uh, can't expect to be perfect because of changes in how the valve responds and, and how you tune uh, the secondary loop. Um, but it is a significant improvement and certainly shows the value of uh, feed forward control. And, um, and uh, I know in distillation column control, it's really meant a lot in terms of energy savings um, by doing um, a feed forward control of uh, whatever the, for whatever the temperature controller in the column is manipulating. And uh, so often it's uh, like a distillate to feed ratio, uh, sometimes a reflux to feed ratio, and less frequently, say, uh, a steam to feed uh, ratio uh, in terms of uh, what the temperature controller is doing. Now, we've got the disturbance um, being removed, and again, there's a feed forward correction uh, for that. And so, um, you know, it's doing a pretty darn good job. But the timing is perfect, uh, or nearly perfect. So uh, let's take a look 
uh, and what happens if the feed for correction uh, arrives too late? And to do that, all we have to do is change the, the primary feed for delay to, to uh, 40 seconds. And so uh, we'll do that here. So now we have 20 seconds additional delay in the feed forward path than exists in the upset path. And we're going to again create a disturbance here. And uh, we'll see um, how well we can do um, with the perfect feed forward gain. Uh, but uh, now with the disturbance arriving um, a little bit too late. And again, in uh, about uh, 30 seconds here, uh, we should be seeing uh, uh, what uh, what's going to happen here on the trend chart. And we can kind of compare, you know, things to um, uh, what uh, we saw previously. Uh, can you see my cursor? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, previously here with no feed forward. Here with a perfect, almost perfect timing of feed forward. And here with a perfect feed forward gain, uh, but unfortunately the feed forward is uh, arriving too late. So we see almost the full disturbance here. Uh, but then um, things get even a little bit worse, and uh, now we're introducing feed forward, but it's a little late, and uh, consequently uh, we're creating uh, the second disturbance. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, we've actually done maybe more more harm here if your concern is uh, uh, really minimizing oscillations, and uh, we've created an oscillation here. And, uh, of course, if the feed forward gain was uh, too high, this oscillation would uh, even be uh, a lot worse. Can you move that trend a bit more to the left? Okay. Yeah, I'll move the trend. Okay. How's that? How's that? Uh, we're, we're hearing that sometimes the trend uh, is not, uh, since we're at the right-hand end of the chart here, that some people can't see it. Okay. It's great. Okay. So now uh, the disturbance uh, is being removed because... Uh, the run is over. We're back to the explore mode, and um, we're seeing uh, the effect of uh, the removal of the disturbance uh, and how feed forward is uh, reacting to that. So uh, you can see we're going through some uh, pretty severe dry erosion oscillations here uh, just due to a uh, timing problem. So that was if it arrives uh, too late. Um, let's see what happens if it arrives too early. So um, we're going to do that simply by changing the primary feed forward delay to uh, zero seconds. Again, uh, there's 20 seconds of delay in the upset path, so um, we're going to arrive about 20 seconds too soon here uh, in terms of our feed forward correction. Uh, so um, let's see what happens when we do another run here to create, which uh, creates low disturbances. So right away we get a feed forward correction before there is a disturbance. Uh, consequently, uh, we're driving it uh, down um, in the opposite direction of the disturbance. Uh, and what uh, this is called is inverse response. Uh, when uh, the initial direction is, uh, is opposite of the final direction of the uh, process variable for the load upset. So, um, here we've uh, created inverse response by having uh, the feed forward signal arrive too soon. <coughs> and uh, again, when we finish the run here, we're going to create another disturbance um, by taking the load out. Uh, so we should be seeing that uh, momentarily. In fact, uh, that's what's happening uh, right now. And we're back to the explore mode. 
And so uh, now we're seeing uh, and the effect of the removal of disturbance and how feed forward is uh, dealing with that. And again, uh, there is this uh, inverse response. Um, so now while that's uh, uh, trying to settle out, uh, let's go on to uh, the next uh, demo. And here uh, we're going to, to uh, show the effect of a feed for correction again, arriving too early, but with a wireless measurement, um, but a traditional PID. So we're going to check and make sure we still uh, have a primary feed for delay of zero seconds. And then uh, we're going to set the primary uh, sens measurement sensitivity to 100%. What that does uh, is uh, remove exception reporting. It means that uh, the measurement would have to change 100% to, to get an exception report. And so I call it sensitivity, but uh, in, in wireless hard, it's called a default trigger level. Uh, then we're going to set uh, the refresh time. How long does it take then, since we're not doing exception reporting, to do periodic reporting? And uh, we're going to say that we're going to get an update uh, every 60 seconds. And, and uh, wireless heart um, terminology, this is the default update rate. Um, we call it refresh time here. And once we do that, uh, we're going to change to the run mode and see what happens. So. Um, we're going to go to measurements, and we're already here. We're going to be on the primary measurement. We're going to set the sensitivity and to 100% so that uh, we don't get an exception report. In other words, the change would have to exceed 100% for us to get a report. Uh, and now we're going to go um, to a, a refresh time or a default update rate of uh, 60 seconds uh, to save on battery life. And um, then uh, we're going to um, see um, uh, what uh, the effect is on a disturbance by doing a run. Well, we have the uh, feed forward correction arriving too soon. And um, uh, since we, we don't have an update, and yet, from wireless, uh, we can see that it says, well, everything's okay, which uh, maybe is good in, in terms of not reacting uh, to, the, um, uh, to the inverse response. Now, I have the luxury here of having a, a plot of the, of the actual process variable. So, like, if you had a wired measurement, uh, uh, you could uh, say that uh, we're getting that as well, and that's in in this kind of olive color here, and it's showing you really what's going on here. And, uh, and, and notice that, hey, uh, we've eliminated the inverse response. We've eliminated the oscillation. Um, and uh, actually, well, things look pretty good, maybe, as a result of, uh, of, uh, of actually having a wireless measurement and, uh, and, and doing uh, this uh, sort of control. Um, now, one of the problems that we're going to see maybe develop here over a period of time is uh, that uh, since it's a traditional PID, uh, the interval action is going to keep uh, ramping. And uh, so we may uh, get into a little bit of trouble, even though right here we're fine. It looks actually pretty good uh, in terms of ignoring uh, what's going on. And while that's uh, developing, um, we're going to uh, go back uh, to uh, the uh, Deminar slides, and uh, we're going to look a little bit more uh, into some examples uh, for uh, feed-forward control. Okay, so here we're going to talk about some examples of feed forward um, applications. And uh, uh, feed forward is uh, the most common advanced uh, control technique used. Uh, in fact, maybe it's so common you wouldn't even classify it as advanced control, but for a lot of PID users, uh, this is advanced for them. Often the feed forward signal is a flow or a speed for ratio control that is corrected by a feedback 
process controller. So uh, the question is, um, uh, why is the signal almost always a flow or speed? Um, and um, the reason is simply that uh, flow is uh, the predominant uh, process input. Uh, that is manipulated. Uh, you know, how do we how do we interface with the process to set production rate and to control uh, key process variables? Well, we do that um, by manipulating a a, a flow, and uh, other flows that are being manipulated by other loops. And so the the primary process input, you know, uh, that are <laughs> And secondary process input is really predominantly uh, a, a flow. Now, why is it sometimes a speed? Well, we don't have a flow measurement, and, and we're actually manipulating a speed on a conveyor or a rotary valve or an extruder um, or something um, like that and, and don't have maybe a flow measurement, so we use a speed. Um, and we could have a variable speed uh, drive, a variable frequency drive, uh, and therefore we're varying the speed of a pump. Uh, that, that could be a way we're actually manipulating a flow. Um, so here we have a lot of examples, and um, you can go through these and, and see that they're typically a, a flow or a speed flow ratios. Um, we talked a little bit about distillation column control because feed forward is so widely used and so important. Uh, one of the exceptions here is uh, is extruder control, and um, I'm not sure this is widely done, but uh, uh, in terms of feed forward control. But if you look at what's important in extruder, it's a, it is to keep a ratio of extruder power input. Uh, to the mixer that's upstream of the extruder, it's, uh, it's power input to keep that ratio uh, constant. And so if, if you're changing mixing power, you need to change the extruder power, but you always need to correct that by, uh, say, the temperature controller on the extruder. Um, And a feed forward control is most effective if the loop dead time is large and, or if the disturbance speed is fast and the size is large. Well, that's, that's kind of logical. And uh, also if the feed forward gain is well known and uh, the feed forward measurement uh, is accurate. And uh, what we're looking at here, the dynamic compensation, uh, the timing of the feed forward signal is accurate. Uh, now, in previous seminars, we did look at set point uh, feed forward, and it's most effective there if the loop dead time exceeds the process time constant and the process gain is well known. And if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about feed forward control, uh, it was uh, the topic uh, of interest back in May 2008 in control talk, and uh, there's the link right there. Now, there's a lot of assumptions that's built into that feed for gain, and uh, theoretically, uh, you could calculate uh, that feed for gain from material energy balances, and it would reveal a lot of these assumptions. So, uh, you know, I like doing that, and that's why I did put out this application note. More than, I think, learn about the assumptions that are in, in, in any feed for gain. Um, and also in, in terms of if you wanted to do some modeling. And, and whether you use these equations yourself uh, to do a simulation or more likely whether you use a simulation package that has these equations, uh, you can have that generate those plots uh, um, uh, that we're talking about for different set points uh, and explore then um, uh, from a plot of the controlled variable and say, uh, composition, conductivity, pH, temperature, or sheet gauge uh, versus the ratio uh, of the manipulated to independent uh, variable. Remember, this x-axis is uh, always typically a ratio. Um, uh, and you can explore things then if you have a simulation capability. Um, but most often what we do is simply base uh, the feed forward gain on operating experience. The operators typically have a desired ratio. There is history of that desired ratio. And so that is uh, used as the feed forward gain. But here we do go into <clears throat> all the assumptions um, that 
um, that are typically in in that uh, desired ratio. And so if uh, conditions are changing the production unit, it, it's nice to know why maybe uh, the feed forward uh, gain uh, is changing and why uh, maybe uh, as a heads up you ought to do a little investigation to take care of that. But again, the bias is going to reveal that, <clears throat> whether if the feedback controller is having to do a whole lot of work uh, to try and compensate for a, 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 an inaccuracy in the feed forward and gain. And then, of course, um, we want to make sure, and that's the subject of today, that the dynamic compensation, the timing, uh, the feed forward signal, is, so it arrives at the same point, at the same time in the process as the upset. And there's a big assumption here that the delay in the feed forward path is not greater than the delay in the upset path. If it is inherently there uh, uh, and you can't do anything about it, there is no dynamic compensation possible uh, to make your feed forward signal, uh, you know, get there sooner or compensate for a delay that you have no control over. So uh, that's an inherent assumption. In any for I've seen feed forward signals are just going to be too late, and so it ends up uh, uh, really they're uh, no value or at best some a limited value. Well, let's go back and see uh, what happened uh, with our um, wireless measurement. It was looking pretty good at first, uh, but uh, let's see uh, what's going on right now. So I'm going to share my desktop, <coughs> and oh my goodness gracious. Um, with a traditional PID, now, while things uh, looked uh, pretty good here uh, in the beginning in terms of how it was dealing with the disturbance, in fact, uh, if you just look at the blue, <coughs> the dark blue, boy, it looked great here in the beginning, but then things got worse and worse, and this is due to the fact that a traditional PID would have to be detuned to take care of this additional uh, dead time uh, created by the wireless uh, refresh time. Uh, in other words, we would have to decrease the controller gain and increase the interval time uh, to uh, detune this uh, controller so that we didn't get into these oscillations, which are uh, essentially full scale at this point. Uh, so what can we do uh, if we don't know how to tune it? And if you do detune it, then you're going to suffer from how are you reacting to um, uh, disturbances and also to set point changes? So uh, let's see if we can do something else here that's smarter. And um, that smarter thing is uh, to use an enhanced uh, wireless uh, PID. And so, uh, you know, we've got this uh, feed forward signal arriving too soon. What we're simply going to do at this point, not retune anything, but just enable uh, the PID plus, and then we're going to have to wait uh, for the process to stabilize. And that's going to take a, a little bit of time. But let's go here to the PID plus for the primary loop, and uh, we're going to enable it. Uh, now, um, it's going to take a while for this whole thing to uh, settle out, um, but, so we have a little patience there. But let's, uh, in the process of uh, waiting here, let's just go back uh, and uh, take a look at uh, maybe again what happens. Um, you know, uh, in, in itself, um, the fact that we had a, a wireless measurement gave us the patience uh, to to wait through a timing error, and uh, therefore, if uh, we didn't go unstable, uh, we would have uh, maybe a pretty good situation. But here, uh, at this point, there's just a very slight error. And then if you uh, look at what's happening here in the output here of the PID, <coughs> uh, you see uh, that it's, it's because of that error, it's ramping and uh, continues to ramp and, and all during this time when uh, the, the measurement has, has not updated. And a result of this ramp here. One question. Did you check that the primary feed forward delay is zero? Oh, I'll check if that primary feed forward delay is zero. That's a good check. Yeah, it is still zero. Okay. Yeah, very good. Thanks for asking about that. And so we're just, um, we got a timing error. It's arriving too soon. Um, 
We've got a wireless measurement, and that looked like it was doing us some good, but uh, we didn't retune it or detune it to prevent these instabilities. But what we simply did was uh, turn on uh, the PID Plus. And uh, hopefully what we're going to get away from is this ramping action uh, that we see here going on uh, in the PID uh, as it's waiting uh, for another update. And that's what's happening with a, a traditional uh, PID with, uh, with its integral action always going on uh, and not waiting for another uh, measurement. Uh, so uh, let's see what has happening now. Well, good grief. It uh, looks like we've stabilized out uh, here. And uh, uh, the key thing is, uh, if, again, I'm focusing on the BID controller output, um, is that it's no longer ramping. And so it, it recognizes it shouldn't be doing anything if it doesn't have an updated measurement. Uh, that's just, uh, basically the, uh, the heart of the smartness of it. And uh, as a result, um, it has uh, stabilized. Oh, sorry, I move it to the left. I keep then move it to the right. So here we can see um, um, <clears throat> that we have stabilized by just turning on the PID plus. We didn't have to retune the controller, so that's pretty neat. You can change wireless update times to uh, say save battery life. It can also compensate for timing errors by eliminating the oscillations. Uh, that we get from timing errors, and um, you don't have to worry about the tuning of it because uh, the PID Plus uh, takes care of that inherently by uh, just a little bit of smartness in its, uh, uh, how it executes uh, the integral action. Um, by the way, this uh, black uh, sawtooth, it's just showing me the elapsed time, and so um, when... Uh, uh, the elapsed time gets to 60 seconds, it then gets an update. So it just has a way of me seeing on this trend uh, what what's going on uh, there with the wireless measurement. Uh, so let's now see uh, what we can do in terms of uh, with the, uh, the feed forward. <coughs> and uh, first we're going to kind of reset conditions back to where they were. Um, not, not that I guess it's that important, but because uh, it's so stable. Uh, and, but we're going to make sure we're all lined out to duplicate the, uh, the start of the other test. Then we will go ahead and change it to 60 seconds. And now with, uh, with uh, feed forward and the PID plus going at the same time, we'll see uh, wh what we get in terms of uh, a response. So, uh, so far as uh, measurements, um, we're going to temporarily just set that to zero seconds. Um, and uh, just uh, give the chance for us to get back at a base case here. And uh, notice here that uh, the elapsed time sawtooth has gone away, showing we have an instantaneous uh, measurement. And uh, uh, everything is kind of really lined out, uh, so we can go back here and put in the 60 seconds uh, as our refresh time, which is the default update rate. And, um, and then um, we can go ahead and, uh, well, we've got the PID plus enabled. Uh, so we're all set there. And uh, then we'll try another run. Now, uh, we did get a little bit of an update here, and, um, and that's because of, uh, you know, if we had actually waited a little bit longer or the disturbance had arrived a little bit sooner, uh, we wouldn't have even had this uh, update that shows a little bit of error. But the important thing is with that little bit of error, uh, we're not reacting to it uh, and by ramping uh, the uh, PID controller. And so uh, as a result... Uh, uh, we're 
uh, doing a, a lot better job here. And uh, now the disturbance has gone away, and uh, we'll uh, see uh, how it uh, then deals with the, this other disturbance uh, created uh, by going in the opposite direction. And, um, and actually, just due to timing purposes, uh, maybe this is going to be a little bit uh, more severe an update, but, um, you know, it's going to uh, settle out here. And, in fact, if we had the timing set up um, exactly right, um, this thing would essentially just kind of line out. <clears throat> and it will line out here. And I tell you what, we'll do uh, one more test and uh, after it lines out and, and show you uh, what's going to go happen if the timing was a little bit uh, better in terms of how the disturbance uh, is arriving. And uh, I guess to do that, let's, uh, uh, let's again uh, go to zero seconds here uh, to uh, take out the, and, and get an update and uh, get everything kind of lined up. <coughs> Okay, and so now we're going to go back to uh, wireless and uh, do another run. So now uh, the timing actually will be uh, a little bit better in terms of updates relative to uh, when the disturbance uh, is created. And uh, we'll see, uh, while it did settle out here, uh, it, uh, we'll see that actually for this case here, things will, will look, uh, I think, a little bit better even. Now, if you could... Um, change uh, or reset the update uh, refresh time um, for uh, when a feed forward comes in, that would be good. I'm not sure we can tell the transmitter that uh, now it, um, it needs to start over as, a, as an update time. But if, if you could, um, uh, we, we'll see here that uh, the performance um, is, is uh, pretty darn good in terms of uh, what we see. Uh, first of all, uh, for the, uh, the measurement effect, uh, in fact, it, it didn't uh, hardly move at all in terms of what you uh, get reported to the control room. Um, however, you got to realize that the actual process variable here, if you had a wired measurement, is seeing the upset. Um, but we've eliminated the oscillation associated and the inverse response associated with the uh, feed forward correction uh, arriving too soon. And uh, similarly here for um, going back to the explore mode and uh, where the upsets removed, we see that actually uh, what we look at in that, on the trend recording in the control room looks almost perfect. Um, and uh, so even though it was a timing error, uh, by introducing the wireless measurement, we just to wait uh, to see what happened. Um, and also with the PID plus or with the patients uh, to uh, wait for another update before it uh, does anything with interval action, uh, we find out that uh, we can uh, um, actually uh, do better with timing errors uh, by, by that combination. Now, the key thing is, is that the PID Plus uh, will always um, uh, execute whenever there is a feed forward change. It doesn't wait for uh, a measurement update. It will execute when there's a feed forward change or when there is a, a set point change or when there's a remote output change. And so uh, as a result, uh, 
um, it, it takes that feed forward correction immediately and, and it doesn't uh, doesn't wait for uh, say the next update in the measurement uh, which uh, you know in some previous implementations um, at PID they, they were trying to do something similar by having the control execution um, set um, to correspond uh, say with the wireless measurement but then um, uh, that by increasing the control execution period, uh, you don't get this immediate reaction to feed forward uh, corrections and also to uh, set point changes. And um, also, uh, it turns out here, as we see, we don't have to do any retuning um, by going with wireless updates, and um, the whole thing uh, behaves uh, really quite nicely here. Uh, you know, despite there being a uh, feed forward uh, timing error. So uh, we'll go back. That's the end of the demos. We'll go back uh, to the seminar slides. Whoops. Skipped over this. Uh, this is the Process Control Lab website. It was down over the holidays uh, because we I was teaching a course for ISA St. Louis section, and we were using the web uh, well, we were using the uh, server, and we actually moved that server into the classroom, and um, it didn't get moved back and connected back up until after the holidays. Um, and so uh, I apologize if you're trying to use it uh, around Christmas, uh, New Year's, uh, but it's back online and it uses um, uh, a method of getting in um, that uh, uh, really uh, eliminates uh, the previous problems we had in terms of using remote desktop because of remote access delays and security issues. And so um, we encourage you uh, to use that. Now some of the um, uh, load disturbances right now are a little bit more random than what I've got shown today because I wanted more repeatability, um, but um, the functionality is uh, there for you to uh, to uh, to work with. Uh, you know all the demonars that we've had today. So summary here. Um, uh, feed forward correction for load upsets usually involves multiplying a feed flow or speed by a ratio that is corrected by a bias from a feedback process controller uh, via bias and gain block. Uh, the ratio of PV and set point should be displayed and trended from a ratio block. Um, I didn't mention this, but I mentioned, you know, that the bias is an indication of uh, the error in the feed forward gain, and you could use an integral-only controller to slowly correct uh, the set point uh, so that matches the ratio of PV, uh, similar to a valve vision controller, and to avoid interactions here with this uh, adapt done by the integral only controller with the main process controller, you got to make sure that the reset time for this uh, integral only controller is greater than uh, 10 times the uh, process feedback controller reset time divided by its controller gain. And then uh, we got to make sure the feed forward delay leading lag should be adjusted so the feed forward does not arrive too early or too late. Compensation of the delay in the feed forward path greater than a delay in the upset path is not possible. A feed forward signal uh, arriving too early creates inverse response. A feed forward signal arriving too late creates a second disturbance. Uh, since inverse response is particularly disruptive, a conservative approach is made uh, to make the feed forward gain slightly less and the timing slightly slower than estimated requirements. And uh, wireless measurements uh, with a PID plus can prevent a feedback controller from reacting to a feed timing error if the refresh time, the default update rate, is um, larger than the process response time. All right. Thank you very much, Greg. I just added a comment there and included a URL. We'd love you to um, take a moment and give a little feedback on these uh, demo seminars. And um, there's the link. You can also cut and paste it from the question and answer box. All right. 
Uh, we hope you'll join us for our next one, which we've got targeted for February 9th at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. And this one's going to be on split range control, which is how to reduce the discontinuity, nonlinearity, and oscillations across the split range point. And also from today's, we'll have later this afternoon the recording as well as the PowerPoint presentations available on both my Emerson Process Experts blog and Greg's modelingandcontrol.com blog. And because, you know, we're just coming out of the holidays and we're feeling still a little bit in the holiday spirit here, we thought we'd get for our attendees a copy of one of Greg's recent books, and I'm holding it right here. And why don't uh, you describe the book a little bit, Greg? Well, uh, since uh, the field measurements and control valves and, and more broadly the final control elements, and including variable speed drives, it's so important uh, that, uh, that you take advantage of or what the latest technology is. Uh, we had uh, opportunity here, and I got a lot of uh, specialists uh, uh, that knew the details uh, to, to really provide us uh, with a lot in terms of uh, the design, configuration, installation, and maintenance of uh, the latest in terms of smart instrumentation and uh, wireless. And it gets into the wireless PID that we demonstrated today. So if you'd like to get your free copy, because we're in the holiday spirit here, send Greg an email at greg.mcmillan at emerson.com and just include your shipping address and we'll get a copy sent out to you. And I bet Greg may even autograph it for you. So um, if you're interested in the book, shoot us an email. It's coming your way. And with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you might have. And we'll uh, give, wait about a minute, look for any to come in, and ask them as they come. Oh, uh, good point. For those of you watching this on recording, this is for the live attendees only. So if you're watching this after the fact in video recording, sorry, you need to catch the next one live if we decide to do this again. Thanks. All right. We want to thank everybody for joining us today, and we'll see you February 9th for the next one.